I am president of Educational Equity Consultants, and I'm also adjunct professor in the Media Communications Department at Webster University. We are in the business of working with school districts throughout the United States and around issues of equity. We like to remove the indicators that race is a primary factor as to why kids are achieving or not achieving. And so uh, we work uh, to help systems look, to help schools look at systems within the whole spectrum of education, hiring practices, curriculum and uh, instruction, parental involvement, uh, culture of a school climate. So I think the top two or top three uh, stereotypes is specifically about black men. One comes out of the hip hop culture, is that individuals that are involved in hip hop, they wear a lot of tattoos and they have a lot of piercings and the music has a lot of cussing in it and uh, messages that are not conducive to uh, productivity. I think that's one stereotype. The other stereotype, which is also a part of the hip hop culture, is the way in, uh, young people dress. The, uh, they e equating sagging with intelligence and being brilliant. There's no correlation between being brilliant and being smart and the way a person dresses. Uh, in fact, if you will, uh, many of the hip hop artists are brilliant individuals. If you think of the, the words to some of the songs and how they have put it together and their, uh, the swag and the, uh, how they, the poetry and things of that nature comes from a, a point of being absolutely brilliant. And so I think that's one stereotype that we need to work to dismiss is that there's, an equ uh, there's a correlation between being smart and the way a person dresses and the music that they listen to. The other stereotype that I think is very uh, upfront and probably the number one stereotype is that black males are walking around angry. And that is not the case. I think what is the case is that we have encountered so much negativity when you cut on the news, when you listen to the radio, when you open up the newspaper, you see nothing but negativity around black males, what they're not doing. We can also look locally at what is going on with the uh, one school district that is going to go to another school district and how those kids are being perceived uh, to come into the district and they're gonna tear it up and they're gonna be violent and we should now put in metal detectors and all of this has been part of the media. And so think about the messages that these kids are getting as they listen to the radio, as they listen to television, as they interact with social media, Facebook. All of that was through on, on Facebook. So as a young black man, what messages am I receiving from that? I'm receiving that nobody wants me, that I am being perceived as violent, I am be being perceived as not smart um, because it said I'm going to bring the test scores down. All those are messages that we receive as black males and so it becomes a part of our fabric when you hear that uh, so much. You know, I tend to see every single kid as being brilliant, as being smart, as wanting to discover, as uh, wanting to ask questions. I try not to stereotype any student based on dress, based on hairstyle, uh, based on piercings, based, based on tattoos. I, look at, I try to look at a student's uh, inner heart, their inner, inner uh, ability to achieve. Where are those students? What can I do to support those students and lift those students up? Uh, and so that's kind of how I address working with, with students. And that's not only how I address working with students, but in people, people in general. Uh, I work with all types of people from all walks of life throughout the United States. And I try not to stereotype based on the first perception uh, that I see of a person. This has not been a cakewalk for African Americans and certainly not a cakewalk for African American males. For example, uh, blacks were prohibited uh, to learn how to read. And so I think reading and literacy and numeracy is very important for us to move forward. And so when you take those items away and say, you can't learn to read and you can't learn math, that's dehumanization of an individual. And so what happens is that you, you turn inward and you start to look at other avenues uh, to act out. And I think a lot of that has happened uh, with a lot of our kids uh, today, and specifically our African-American men. As a high school principal, there were many times we would ask students about goals and where they plan to be and that you would hear answers like my goal is to live to next week or through next week or to live one more year 
or it would be a student's birthday and I remember walking down the hall saying, uh, well, happy birthday and a student will reply, I lived another year, Mr. Neal. You know, so you get those types of comments that let you know what that mindset is. And so how, if I'm struggling to think about my survival for one more day, for one more week, for one more year, I'm certainly not thinking about, I need to read this book for my, my uh, English class, or I need to complete these set, this set of math problems for my math class, or I need to learn this history, but you're thinking about more like survival. Many times in my training, I talk about socialization, and I give the example of a young baby uh, who is just born into the world, and what we see is basically a clean slate. And as adults, we start to, that social, socialization process for kids. One example is if you go visit a baby in a nursery, more than likely you're gonna see the girl baby wrapped in a pink blanket and the boy baby wrapped in a blue blanket. Why? Whoever said that it has to be that way. So right away, we have put that socialization on that, that child in terms of what colors belong to what gender. And so we carry that on. There are ways that we socialize girls, there are ways that we socialize boys through toys, through things that we say to, to kids. Big boys don't cry. But if a girl cries, certainly, you know, she can come run to mom or run to daddy. And so, and those are just some small examples of the whole socialization process. But part of the socialization process is the reason that we start to act out of or act a certain way uh, regarding certain stereotypes. Well, one of the things I think is, uh, that has really drawn me into the Harvest Church is that there seems to be no boundaries for come in, be with us, be a part of us, we meet you where you are. Uh, you dress, you just show up. And uh, before that, I was a member of a number of churches and you felt compelled to, I have to put on my shirt and tie every day. I have to speak a certain way. I have to cover up my tattoos. I can't show that I have piercings. I can't have certain feelings in this church um, because it's just not acceptable. And what I have found at the Harvest Church, is, it's basically come as you are, just as the Bible says, come as you are. And it's open and everybody is loving and caring and uh, everybody receives and accepts everybody from where they are. Now certainly we can grow together, we can learn from one another. Um, one of my uh, partners in my business uh, uses the mantra, I haven't arrived, I just agreed to go. So we're always on this journey. You know, none of us have arrived, but we, are, we have agreed to go on this journey together.